Okay, we're ready to begin. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ninth press conference, the first one today, Friday, January 15th, 2021, here at the virtual 237th meeting of the American Astronomical Society. Uh, we're glad to have you with us today. Uh, it's been a great meeting so far, and it looks like uh, the final day will be uh, no exception. Um, I don't remember if I introduced myself yet. <laughs> I'm Rick Feinberg, AAS Press Officer. And I'm uh, joined today uh, by uh, three people who are helping me run these briefings this week. Um, we have Susanna Kohler, who is the editor of our AAS Nova website, where we uh, highlight interesting papers that, have that are appearing in our journals. Um, Tharani Conchati is the AAS Media Fellow. She's a grad student at Texas A&M. And Haley Wall is our Astrobytes media intern. She's a grad student at West Virginia University. Um, Tharani today is going to be helping me uh, by monitoring the questions and answers in the Q&A box. And Haley is going to be paying attention to the Slack chat. So just want to give you a couple of quick technical details. Uh, the Q&A button is to open a Q&A window where you can ask questions of the presenters as they come up. Um, You'll be typing those questions in text and then Tharani will indicate that she's going to answer them live. What that really means is that she is going to read your questions aloud to the panelists once we get to the Q&A uh, after the presentations. Uh, we do this because we are recording the briefing and we are live streaming to YouTube. And if we don't do the Q&A aloud and with video on, uh, the questions and answers just get lost in the recording and, and uh, people can't see them or hear them on the, uh, on the live stream either. Okay. Um, and if you want to chat with each other, or kibitz a little bit, uh, you can do that via the Slack channel. Uh, if you haven't added it yet to your Slack, the uh, channel number begins with triple zero press conferences. All right. So, um, I want to mention that there are uh, three press releases that I know about, uh, one coming out from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, one from Northwestern University, and one from the Green Bank Observatory. Um, and so uh, look for those. Uh, not only will they be uh, appearing on those institutions' websites, but I will, uh, or we will tweet the headline and links via our Astronomy in the News section on the AAS website, as well as via our AAS underscore press Twitter account. I should also mention that all of the briefings to date uh, are now uh, in the press kit with links to the briefing videos, links to the presentation files that I've received so far, and links to the press releases that, that went out in support of them. Okay, so I think that is everything. So this morning, or this afternoon's press conference, at least for us here on the East Coast, um, is entitled The Modern Milky Way, and we've gathered up uh, four presentations on results relevant to investigations of our own galaxy and stars and gas and clouds within them, within the galaxy. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, four presentations. They'll be given by five speakers, and they'll be in the following order. Uh, Sile Savant from the Florida Institute of Technology will present extreme contrast ratio imaging of Sirius with a charge injection device. That's not a charge couple device, it's something different. Xinlong Cheng and Borgia Anguiano from the University of Virginia will present galactic warp through the lenses of Gaia Data Release 2 and the Apogee Survey, which you heard about during the Sloan Digital Sky Survey press conference a couple days ago. Jeffrey Andrews from Northwestern University will prevent Thea 456, a new stellar association in the galactic disk. And again, you heard about stellar associations uh, in an earlier briefing. And last but not least, Kat Barger from Texas Christian University will present the Milky Way's defensive halo blocks an incoming gas cloud. So now I'll turn it over to Siley, and then each of the presentations will occur in order and we'll do the Q&A at the end. All right, over to you, Siley. Thank you so much.
Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sally Salvin from Florida Institute of Technology. And today I will present new developments in direct contrast ratio imaging with charge injection device. There exist many situations in observational astronomy where we must perform observations of faint targets in vicinity of extremely bright sources. The intrinsic nature of astro astronomical objects such as exoplanets, binary systems, circumstellar disk, and quasar host galaxies highlight the candle next to the lighthouse problem. The glare from bright sources completely obscures the surrounding regions. One such exa example is this Hubble Space Telescope image of Sirius A, the brightest star in our nighttime sky, along with its faint tiny stellar companion, Sirius B. This image was taken to determine the position of Sirius B. However, within, even with DHST, it presented significant observational challenges due to the extreme brightness of Sirius A and large brightness difference between Sirius A and Sirius B, that is its high contrast ratio. Sirius B is about 10,000 times fainter than Sirius A. As discussed in the paper cited here, there was no combination of narrowband filter and no uh, short exposure time that delivered an unsaturated image of Sirius A. The light from bright sources completely saturates the conventional imaging instrumentation, such as CCDs and CMOS detectors. The fabrication and readout architecture impose strict limitations on the full well capacity and the dynamic range of these detectors. This restricts the directory achievable, achievable contrast ratios to five. Several techniques are implemented to suppress the bright source signal and subsequently achieve higher contrast ratios. However, their complex operational requirements make faint de signal detection extremely difficult, expensive, and time consuming. Now, here's an important question. How do we conduct observations for contrast that have many orders of magnitudes higher and for targets that are at even smaller angular separation? The solution is to employ CID imaging that could potentially provide a simple, cost-effective, and powerful solution to observe and study ECR scenes. CIDs are available off the shelf, and they have the intrinsic ability to achieve extreme contrast ratios owing to their readout, unique readout architectures and inherent anti-blooming abilities. The theoretical contrast ratio achievable by these 32-bit integer detectors is 9.6. The figure illustrates the basic CID operation, readout operation that is different from the CCD readout operation. Dr. Bachelor and I carried out, sorry, Dr. Bachelor carried out the on sky testing of the latest generation of CID in 2015, known as the SpectraCam XTR. The detector was installed on Florida Tech 0.8 meter Ortega telescope. These are 20 second exposure V band XTR images of the Sirius field. The signal from Sirius is not saturated. These observations demonstrated a direct raw contrast ratio of one part in 20 million. However, the atmospheric conditions introduced a practical limit on the contrast ratios otherwise achievable using CIDs. The next step forward was to study this field from a world-class observing site with optimal seeing conditions. Therefore, we installed the SXDR on one meter JKT telescope located in La Palma. This is a pre-exposed, pre-processed, sorry, this is a pre-processed I-band XDR SXDR image of the Sirius field with an exposure time of 180 seconds. The signal from Sirius is still not saturated. The visible artifacts, such as these annular patterns, are due to multiple light reflections within the telescope. These patterns are purely intrinsic to the JKD due to its optical design. I performed basic data reduction and then carried out wavelet-based image analysis for noise estimation and filtration, followed by source detection astrometric calibration and photometric calibration to acquire the contrast ratio measurements. This is a post-process image version of the same image. Out of all of these detected sources, only 33 have been cataloged on the Simba database. For the faint source in the inset, 
we acquired the contrast ratio of one part in 100 million. This corresponds to an 18th magnitude source. This is a plot of contrast ratios as a, func a function of angular separation arc seconds for I-band SXDR image of the series field. And lastly, this is the zoomed in view of the same image. Series A is at the center and series B is marked in red. It is important to know that no complex operational requirements were imposed to acquire this unsaturated image of series A. The CID imaging delivers a simple yet powerful way to acquire images of ECR scenes from ground-based observations. Furthermore, Dr. Bachelor and I analyzed the data acquired during an eight month CID technology demonstration mission where the CID camera was mounted, mounted on both the International Space Station. No significant on-orbit changes were observed in terms of CID performance. Based on the quantitative results discussed in the paper cited here, CIDs are now space qualified to TRL level eight and can be considered for future space telescopes. To summarize, we acquired unsaturated SXDR images of serious field with an exposure time of 180 seconds. This has never been done before. We detected and resolved previously uncatalogued sources along with series B without imposing complex operational requirements. We demonstrated a direct achievable contrast ratio of one part in 100 million using one meter telescope. With this, we delivered a simple, cost-effective, yet powerful technique that combines CID imaging and software-based image analysis. The next step is to carry out CID imaging from an observing, observing site that houses even larger telescopes to achieve even higher contrast ratios and detect even fainter sources. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shenlong, a graduate student at University of Virginia, and together with the postdoc within our research group, Boha, we will be continue. Uh, we will be pre sorry about the video. Uh, hi, I'm Shenlong, a graduate student at University of Virginia, and together with postdoc within our research group, Boha, we will be presenting our work on glottic work through the lenses of Gaia Data Release Two and the Apogee Survey. Thank you very much, Yen Long. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me give you a little bit of background about the study we're going to present today. So the widely accepted theory for galaxy formation is called Lambda CDM. This theory predicts a hierarchical galaxy formation. If you pay attention to the top right figure, you can see how a dwarf galaxy is being cannibalized but a larger one. If we go now bottom left figure, you see a representation of the Milky Way galaxy where we live in. And in red, you see what we call the Sagittarius string. The Sagittarius string is currently a dwarf spherical galaxy that is being accreted in our own Milky Way. Moreover, the Milky Way has his own satellites. The most prominent and massive ones are the Magallanes clouds that we see in this, in this figure. So all these satellites and all these accretion events uh, can gravitationally perturb the Milky Way disk. I can make it warp. Here you have a picture of an extragalactic galaxy with a prominent warp. So let me introduce a little bit what we know about the galactic warp. Uh, we know it's a bending of the galactic disk. It has been known for a while, for decades already. Um, radio astronomy mapping the hydrogen in the galactic disk discovered it in the 70s. Um, it's a common future, it's ubiquitous in our universe. Most of the galaxies, most of the spiral galaxies, they present this phenomena, this warp. The origin is not completely understood, but recent results, in including our results, in pointing out that it's a gravitational phenomena where the galactic disk is being perturbed for massive objects. There is still uncertainty uh, that needs to be uh, uh, addressed 
to fully understand the galactic world. What is the geometry? What is exactly the geometry of the world in the galactic in the Milky Way? Uh, is the sun participating in the warp? What is the onset of the warp? What is the extension of the galactic war in the Milky Way? So to address these questions, we want to, we were using in this study state of their data coming from the Gaia satellite and from the SDSS Apogee survey. Let me very briefly introduce what the Gaia satellite uh, is. It's an ongoing mission, it's taking data right now, uh, and it's measuring the position and the motions and the parallaxes of billions of stars with an unprecedented accuracy. So you all know that the parallax is an angle. To give you an idea, Gaia is able to measure the angle of a coin in the surface of the moon. This level of precision allows astronomers to get precise distances and precise motions of the stars, kinematics, velocities. And we are using this to address the galactic world. Together with this, we are also using the Apogee survey. This part of the SDSS consortium. This is a ground based effort. Uh, it's about to finish more than 10 years collecting data. It's a high resolution spectroscopy. And this is giving us uh, the opportunity to get royal velocities, velocities in the line of sight to an unprecedented accuracy of a few hundred meters per second. Not only that, the high resolution spectra allow us to measure stellar abundances using the metallic lines you see here in this. So combining all these uh, motions from Gaia and Apogee, it gives us the opportunity to address uh, different stellar uh, populations and also get ages to understand the warp of the galaxy. Right. A good analogy to what the warp is, is audience doing the wave in stadium, as illustrated in the video to the right. Each individual member of the audience stands up and sits down one after another. But to someone overlooking the stadium far away, they would see a wave rotating around the center of the stadium, even though no one is moving around the stadium itself. What we have discovered can be described as stars that are further from the galactic center than the sun are doing the wave, just like a wave in the stadium. Using a more scientific term, the Milky Way galaxy is warped and the starting radius of the warp is further out than the orbit of the sun. Here we present an artistic rendering of the warp and the label the orbit of the sun around the galaxy with a white circle. As we can see, the warp does not begin until further out than the orbit of the sun. What we also have to understand is while the wave is going around the galaxy, like the wave in the stadium, the sun and the stars are also going around the galaxy, which is like the stadium itself is rotating. We discovered that the warp is rotating at half of the speed of the rotation speed of the sun and in the same direction. In the period of time where the sun rotates once around the galactic center, the warp is only halfway through its journey. We also discovered that stars of different ages are responding to the galactic warp differently. We found by their motions that stars older than 3 billion years were already in place before the large perturbation took place and only weakly responded to it. Younger stars showed the most dramatic response because many were being born while the working motion was working its way through their first cause. This points to the origin of the warp as likely due to a strong gravitational perturbation from a satellite galaxy passing the disk less than 3 billion years ago. Here is a visualization of the warp in our Milky Way galaxy. As we can see, the rotation rate of the warp is much, much slower than the rotation rate of the galactic bar and spiral arms, and only about half of the speed of the rotation of the sun, which is shown here by that orange dot. This animation will be available with the press release. Here are the QR codes to our paper and press release page, and thank you. Uh, 
Hi, so uh, my name is Jeff Andrews. I'm a Sierra Fellow at Northwestern University, and I want to talk to you about this recent uh, discovery we made about this object, Theo 456. And I want to start by showing an image of the Milky Way sky. So apart from the obvious stellar stream in the middle showing the galactic plane along with some dust lanes, you see that there are some stellar structures here. Uh, one example is the large and small Magellanic clouds in the southern hemisphere, but if you look closer, you also see some dots here. And if you were to point a telescope at those dots, you would see uh, star, star clusters. Um, and they come in two flavors. For instance, Omega Sen is a globular cluster. And uh, the Pleiades, which is, you can almost not even see it, is a, an open cluster. And 50 years ago, this was our image of, this was, this was our understanding of star clusters in the Milky Way. So they came in these two flavors. And that started to change with the advent of survey telescopes. In particular, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey really impacted our, our understanding of how stars exist in the Milky Way. And I'm showing here uh, an image from sort of a, a combination of, of images from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which looked outside the galactic plane. And you can see that there are these stellar streams here, that these over densities these, that are streaking across the sky. For instance, the Sagittarius stream, which we just heard about, uh, Palomar 5 and GD1. And we now understand these to be the, the tidally stripped remnants of satellite galaxies that have been accreted by the Milky Way. In the past couple of years, our understanding has again been revolutionized, in particular by the Gaia satellite, which, which we just heard a really nice description of. It's a satellite that has very precise astrometry. It provides positions, uh, the distances to the stars, and uh, how quickly stars move across the sky. Um, with very, very precision, you know, very high precisions. And from that, uh, collaborators of mine, Marina Kunkel and Kevin Kobe, applied some machine learning algorithms to this catalog, and they identified a whole bunch of structures, several thousand structures uh, in this Thea catalog. And I'm focusing on one of those, which is Thea 456. And I'm showing here just the, the distribution of stars on the sky. And immediately it should strike you exactly how large this thing is. It spans nearly 25 degrees. And in comparison, uh, I'm showing circles here of the size of the moon roughly and roughly the size of the Pleiades. This is a very large stream, relatively speaking. It spans over 200 parsecs long, and it's also at a half a kiloparsec, which is relatively distant to us. Uh, if you actually show where this stream exists on the Milky Way itself, uh, and I'm showing on the left uh, a face-on image of the Milky Way, and I'm comparing the positions of the sun as a red star and the Thea 456 members as black dots. Uh, and I'm comparing those with the positions of, of known spiral arms in the Milky Way. And what we see is that these positions are almost overlap with one of the local, one of the, the spiral arms, the local arm. Um, now we can take the data from Gaia and go a step further. We can actually take the positions and motions of these stars and backtrack in time where they used to be. And that's what I'm showing here on the left. Uh, again, this is an image of a, a face on image of the Milky Way. And the bottom two panels are edge on images of the Milky Way uh, from, from either angle. And the, the black stars, the black uh, streaks are just the trajectories backwards in time of random Milky Way disk stars. And the red streaks are Theo 456 stars. And what this is suggesting to us is that Theo 456 really is uh, an object, it's, it's a stellar um, group within the Milky Way disk itself. Uh, and if we were to imagine you know, where these stars exist now and backtrack that in time where they used to exist on the sky, so we could integrate their positions in the sky backwards in time, 20 million years ago, 40 million years ago, and 60 million years ago. And what we find is that the positions, even though today it appears that it's a relatively, um, you know, it's a relatively elongated stream, in the past, it was much more condensed than it is today. And so that asks the, begs the question, were these stars born together? Is Theo 456 really an object that was born, uh, you know, essentially from the same, um, were all the stars born together at the same time? And there's, there's sort of two ways we can get at this question. One is by looking at the metallicity of these stars. And for that, we use the, the, the spectroscopic catalog LAMOST. And LAMOST is a, it's a, a big telescope survey that um, has looked at millions of stars in the Northern Hemisphere. And when we cross match those stars in the catalog with the positions of Theo 456, we find on the left, all the, the colored circles here. And these stars span across the whole cluster, but what, what you should take away from this is that they're all pretty close to the same color. 
and the color corresponds to the iron abundance. So what this means is that we think the stars in Theo 456 have a common iron abundance um, across the, the whole uh, group. Uh, it's slightly subsolar of uh, as an, uh, an iron abundance of minus 0 0.08, um, which suggests that these were sort of born from the same gas cloud is really is really what that suggests. Uh, and then we can have a, a second element. There's a second aspect to this, which is gyrochronology. And if you don't know what gyrochronology is, it's a very it's very easy to understand. Uh, all stars are born rotating. And over time, they slow their rotation down. Their rotation, their, you know, how quickly they spin around, it slows down. And the amount it slows down depends upon how massive the star is. So for example, uh, if you take the Pleiades at 120 million years, and you want to find out what the rotation periods of all the stars are, you use telescopes like NASA's TESS or NSF, uh, the NSF-funded ZTF. And these are telescopes which repeatedly measure the, the brightness of a star, and you can determine the rotation periods from that. And I'm showing the, the stars in the Pleiades, um, the rotation periods in days as a function of their color. Now, the color is a proxy for mass. So you can think of this x-axis as something like mass. And at 120 million years, you have the Pleiades. But if you go to slightly longer ages, say Persepi, which is a, a, a stellar cluster that's roughly 670 million years old, you see that the distribution is fundamentally different. These stars have essentially slowed down their rotation and had longer rotation periods. And you can compare it to other older clusters like NGC 6811 at, at 1 billion years old or Ruprecht 147 at 2.7 billion years. And you find that there's a there's a, a, a series of curves that, that describe um, essentially how old a stellar population is. And you can use this backwards to determine how old Theo 456 is. So where do Theo 456 stars lie? Well, somewhere near the Pleiades. So what we find is that um, Theo 456 has an age that's something like 100 million years old, um, which suggests that the stars have, a, have the same age. Um, so before I want to go to my conclusions, I want to emphasize one point here that you know, any individual telescope provides you know, enormously valuable information. But when we combine all of these together, we get a much richer and more complex picture of astronomical objects like Theo 456. In this case, it took you know, many different efforts by many different nations, and we were able to look at all those data and really understand deeply what, what this object is. Um, so uh, my conclusions, I just want to emphasize a couple things. Uh, we think Theo 456 is a new stellar structure in the Milky Way disk, uh, most likely as a common origin. With And we, we know that because of our dynamical modeling, the positions of stars, because the stars have a consistent metallicity and age. And finally, the last point that I really want to, to, to really emphasize here is that this is just the beginning. Thea 456, we chose this one because we had the best data for it, because it was the most promising from what we, was available. But there are thousands of these objects, uh, of these stellar groups in this, this Kunkel and Covey catalog, as well as others. So it suggests that the Milky Way is replete with you know, structures just like this one. And, and Thea 456 really is just the tip of the iceberg. So thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Our galaxy is gradually running out of gaseous materials, forming stars and planets. Eventually, it'll run out of gas altogether. That is, unless it can capture new sources of gas replenishment. One gas cloud that it's in the process of capturing is high velocity cloud complex A. This gas cloud contains with it enough material to form 2 million stars and countless planets. It's heading towards our galaxy just due to the gravitational pull of the Milky Way. But of course its journey isn't quite so simple. It needs to travel through the defensive halo 
that surrounds the Milky Way, which is a million degree temperature gas that's low density. If we zoom in on our gas cloud, we can see that there's many indicators that this gas cloud is getting beaten up, banged up by the interactions with the halo. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to understand how gas clouds traverse that defensive halo of our galaxy and whether or not, or how much of that material can actually make it to the disk of our galaxy to form the next generations of stars and planets. So what we did was we observed this gas cloud with a green bank telescope at over 100,000 locations. And in doing so, we were able to make the most detailed map of a gas cloud that is headed towards our galaxy. And here is that map here. Now, because these observations are spectroscopically resolved, we are able to not just look to see how this gas cloud looks on two-dimensional space, where we have the galactic longitude and latitude here, and the region of the gas cloud that's headed towards us and the portion that's trailing behind. But we can also look to see how the motions of the gas are behaving, which gives us insight on those interactions with that defensive halo. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna rotate through to a third dimension, which shows us the motion of the gas cloud. And now what we have here in this new view is on the bottom of the plot, we have portions of the gas cloud that are moving very fast towards our galaxy. And on the top of the plot, we have material that's lagging behind. The orange colored material is a material that's higher density and the gray material, gray and yellow, is material that is much less dense. Notice that the orange colored material is on the bottom here, which means that it's traveling faster towards our galaxy. And the reason for that is that that material is able to self shield itself and protect itself so that that way it can better survive the journey versus the less dense material on the top it's just not able to protect itself and it really gets beat up. And then lastly, we'll go ahead and rotate back into our position, position map that we saw earlier with how this gas cloud looks on the sky in radio when we're looking at the neutral hydrogen. To create this map, I had the help of a young astronomer, Canon Huey Yui, who worked on this project from the age of nine to 11 while he was still in high school. Since then, he's now an undergraduate student at Texas Christian University about to graduate. Canon worked with me on exploring the morphology and structure and general shape to see what's happening, where instabilities are forming in, the, in this gas cloud. And he was instrumental in helping us develop the, the concept of this three-dimensional movie for our paper. Here he is shown here presenting at the 2017 SS meeting as the youngest presenter. And he's here as the, the third author for that work. Now with the information we have with these extraordinarily sensitive observations, not only can we explore their motions, but we can explore their morphology, the shape, what's happening to this gas cloud as it's interacting with the halo. And we see a lot of interesting structures for instance, if we look on the lower half of this gas cloud, we see these weird structures protruding on the bottom side of the gas cloud in the direction that the Milky Way is pulling. Essentially drips, these little drips are being caused because the gas cloud of complex A, it has a higher density than the halo gas that it's resting on top of. And so essentially this gas cloud is oozing through that defensive halo. So material is just oozing through, it's kind of fun. We also see that some of these drips are being reorientated backwards. And the reason why they're being reorientated in that direction is because as they travel through the halo, the halo acts as a way to create a, an apparent headwind, much like if you were standing on your bicycle and you weren't pedaling at all, there's no wind. But as soon as you start pedaling, all of a sudden the wind hits your face and your hair rushes backwards. Well, that's essentially what's happening to this gas cloud. As it's traveling through the halo, the interactions with the halo act to create a wind against this gas cloud, which pushes its material backwards. On the top of the gas cloud, we also have some interesting instability structures that are coming off the top side. And those are shear instabilities that are caused 
by rubbing against the halo. Overall, we see that this gas cloud is getting elongated and it's getting fractured. This fracturing is, is being caused likely because the gas cloud cools at different efficiencies at different locations. But overall, once this gas cloud gets elongated, fractured, chunks of it protrude out, what that means is that that gas cloud is going to be less protected from interactions with the halo. And since the halo is a million degrees Kelvin, it's very hot gas, it's going to warm up that gas cloud and chunks of the gas cloud will slowly dissolve in the halo. And if it's dissolving into the halo, what that means that, the, that there's going to be less material that can survive the journey to actually reach the disk of our galaxy to, to provide the material needed to make the next generation of solar systems. Additionally, I wanted to supply you with a couple quotes if you wanted to include them in any press releases. I wanted to highlight one particular quote that I really like by our youngest astronomer, Canon Huey Yui. What he says is, and we looked at complex A, it is headed towards our galaxy and it causes a headwind, which makes the back pieces strip off. And I think that really summarizes really well that this gas cloud is getting really banged up just by traveling through the Milky Way's defensive halo, which will have big repercussions for how well and how much stars our galaxy will be able to form in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much to all our presenters. As we await them uh, coming back on video, let me just remind the attendees that you may uh, ask questions via the Q&A box. I see we have some queued up already um, and uh, we'll hopefully have plenty of time to get to all of the questions. All right, so um, I'm going to turn it over to Tharani who will be uh, asking questions aloud on behalf of those that uh, have entered them in the Q&A box. So Tharani, over to you. Thanks, Rick. Uh, this first question comes from Joan Nahida of NSF's Noir Lab, and it's for Siley. How do the contrast ratios achieved compare with those from point spread function subtraction techniques? Thank you for this question. Um, is it okay if I share the slides again? Yes, go right ahead. Okay, so over to this slide, where the current, uh, the current techniques, uh, the, the point spread function techniques, because of these high uh, operational requirements and the imaging um, instrumentation that they use, the achievable contrast ratios are limited between five and seven. But the theoretical uh, contrast ratios achievable by CIDs are can potentially exceed, uh, potentially go up to 9.6. And the uh, reason for this is um, the readout architecture, um, the way the uh, C uh, CIDs are fabricated and how their uh, readout uh, architectures are. And given the fact that the dynamic range is up to, uh, since there are 32 um, bit integers, the dynamic range uh, follows that, um, that scheme rather than the normal 16 bit, uh, bit uh, integers for CCDs imaging. Siley, if I could just clarify, when you say a contrast ratio of five to seven, given that you're using a log scale, you mean a contrast ratio between 100,000 and 10 million, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so when you say uh, eight to nine and a half, we're talking 100 million to more than a billion. Billion, yeah, one part in one billion. Yes, okay, it can pos uh, potentially exceed one part in one billion. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, this next question, also for Siley, from uh, Jen Hattenbach, freelance. What possible use may CID devices have in future observations? Can they be used, for example, to image exoplanets with ground-based telescopes? OK, um, again, I'd like to point out that uh, even those uh, um, CIDs ha can potentially exceed uh, by reaching one part in one billion contrast ratios, they do not address um, inner working angle situations. 
So which means the, uh, the separation between the star and uh, whatever the target might be. Uh, and if the point spread function of the star is not well understood, then it might be a problem. But however, uh, the point, uh, since Earth's um, atmosphere is a major contributor uh, to the PSF variability, what we can do is the best um, obser um, observations can happen from space. And that's why one of the very reasons why um, Dr. Bachelor had um, tested this and I analyzed the data of uh, to test the CID performance from space. Um, even though uh, the what you can do is uh, CID, uh, CIDs can be used in future space telescope with simple uh, and um, simple and cost effective software uh, PSF software based techniques rather than uh, you know having really difficult operation requirements like template P uh, PSAs or high wavefront uh, wave quality or stable tracking uh, pointing and um, tracking controls you don't need additional optical elements all you need is a simple base it can combine with simple software based PSF techniques and yes you can image um, exoplanets uh, using uh, CIDs as um, imaging instrumentation. Thank you. Uh, this question is also for you, Siley. It comes from Leslie Sage of Nature. How specifically does this work, this being CIDs? Uh, CCDs put electrons in wells, which are then rent out. Mm -hmm. How does a CID convert the photons to a signal? Okay, uh, so I would like to point out this, um, uh, this slide. I hope you can see the charge injection devices and this figure three, which is a basic CID readout operation. Now, um, as um, I, like, I would like to recall that um, CCD, um, for CCDs, there's one MOS uh, capacitor per pixel, but for CID, there are two MOS capacitors per pixel. So essentially what happens is, um, the charge is accumulated in the potential well, but when there is a zero level readout, the charge is transferred from one mass, from one potential well to the other one in the same pixel. So there is an intra cell pixel transfer rather than pixel to pixel transfer, how it is in CCD um, devices. And from there, once you have a zero level readout, then there's again a signal readout. So, and the difference between these two readouts correspond to the voltage uh, rather than um, as opposed to how it is read in CCD where you have the parallel resistors, the serial resistors, and then it's output into, um, uh, then it is sent to the amplifier where it is converted into the, the voltage. So what happens over here is after the signal readout, the, you get two options. One is called as the uh, destructive readout where the charge is inject injected into the substrate substrate itself. But then you have a, what is called as a non-destructive readout. And what this does is um, if you're looking at a really, really bright star, right? What it does, it identifies what is called as a region of interest in a short pre-exposure. So if you're looking at the bright star and in order to avoid that saturation, what it does is it, the pixels are integrated and read out until a threshold is reached. Uh, for example, 75% of the full well capacity. Then the signal is read out itself and stored with a timestamp. And then the charge is uh, injected into the substrate. The pixel is returned to the step A, which is the accumulation mode. And the whole process is repeated again until the whole uh, exposure time is reached. And then the whole uh, image is then combined and re read out to give a wider dynamic range. That's why CIDs have adaptive dynamic range. One of the reasons, the reasons why the image, what you saw, the one um, 80 second exposure image wasn't saturated. Thank you. Welcome. Um, this next question comes from Rick Lovett, freelance for Jeff. How do the light curves of stars reveal their rotations? Star spots or something else? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Um, you know, if, if a star was a perfectly radiating sphere, then no matter how fast it was rotating, you wouldn't see any effect in the light curve. And, but some, even some small spot, sunspots, star spots are enough to cause a little bit of variation 
which is periodic, and you figure out what the period is, and that's the rotation period of the star. Thanks. Uh, these next two questions are also for you, Jeff. First one comes from Jan Hattenbach, freelance. So is Theia 456 practically a former open cluster as young as the Pleiades, but much more stripped apart? What happened to it? And if there are more objects like it, are we looking at a new type of star cluster, one that is stripped apart much faster than typical open clusters? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, let me first say that this is this is still work in preparation. We're still in the middle. Of, you know, we're still working on the analysis. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to say maybe a couple speculative things here. Um, but the fact is that uh, that we think um, you know the age is very similar to the Pleiades. Uh, if you look at this one, yes, it is more stretched out. It is you know, it's more of a stream. Um, but the other thing that we're finding in this Thea catalog that um, that uh, Kunkel and Kobe found is uh, is that many of the open clusters we know have potentially streams of stars attached to them that we just hadn't found before, and so it's possible that um, that I, I mean I, I'm not going to speak to the Pleiades specifically, but it's it's possible that you know what we're finding now in Thea is is actually more common than we initially thought. That um, what used to be you know star clusters that we we see potentially now we're seeing. You know, larger complexes that they're part of. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's that's all that I'm comfortable saying right now. I guess the last part of your answer dovetails nicely into the next question, which comes from Leslie Sage from Nature. Can you estimate how many such structures exist in the Milky Way? Um, you know, I haven't done that calculation. Uh, it should be possible to come up with some number, but I have to say that the error bars would be so large on it. Um, you know, it's just really hard to, to take into account any any biases uh, in your sample set selection. It's really, really difficult to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, these next two questions are for Kat. Uh, the first one comes from Rick Lovett, freelance. How big is complex A and where is it in the sky? How far yeah. away and how many stellar mosses and when will it arrive if it makes it through? <laughs> See if I can answer all those. Okay, so for the length of it, it's roughly 6.5 kiloparsecs long. So in thousands of light years, that's about 21,000 light years. This particular gas cloud is, um, contains about 2 million times the mass of the sun in gas. Uh, it'll arrive in our galaxy in about 70 million light years, or sorry, 70 million years. Uh, are there any other questions with that? Um, mosses, how big is it? Where is it in the sky? Oh, it's close to, uh, it's close, it's in the Northern hemisphere, close to a galaxy M82. So that's really near like um, Ursa Major. Yeah. And when you say close to M82, you mean in direction, but you're not saying it has any association with M82. No, no, not any association, but there, it's M82 is right off the side of complex A. Thank you. Uh, the second question for you, Kat, comes from James Erton of the University of Washington. Can you ultimately project how much of complex A, if any, will make it through the halo? Yeah, I don't have specific numbers, but I can do kind of an order of magnitude, you know, based off of what we're seeing. So we currently have 2 million solar masses and based off of another study we did back in 2012, about half of the gas cloud is already ionized and is getting pretty heated up. So I'm imagining that at least half of it won't make it, if not, you know, maybe three fourths of it won't make it to, um, to our, our galaxy. These gas clouds can evaporate pretty rapidly with halo gas interactions. Thank you. Uh, this next question is for Jeff from Rick Lovett, freelance. How many stars are in Thea 456? So right now there's 468 stars. Um, we think there's probably some contamination in that sample and we think there likely are stars that are part of this complex, which were not yet detected. So we're working on an updated membership catalog, but you know, we don't have that ready yet. Thank you. Uh, this next question is for Borja and Zindlum from James Erton of the University of Washington. One of you said that a majority of spiral galaxies show signs of warping. Which ones don't? 
do they all have something in common, like not having any satellite galaxies to perturb them? Thank you, James. Yeah, but sadly, this is currently depending on the environment. Okay, uh, yes, it does correct. Most of the spiral galaxies, they solve this warping because they are being perturbed by the satellites, but this hierarchical merging activity. So the galaxies that they don't is because they are pretty isolated and they are not being gravitationally affected by their neighbors. Is there any um, correlation between uh, galaxies that are warped and the presence of bars? Or is that um, just not, not a factor here? That's a great question, actually, Rick. Um, uh, well, I believe that um, the bar definitely is a dynamical process, but I believe this is linked more to the secular and internal uh, evolution of the disk, more than, than being perturbed from outside. Thank you. Uh, this next question is for Jeff from Monica Young at Sky and Telescope. I apologize if I missed this, but can you say anything about the origin of Theia 456? Does it come from within our galaxy and was just torn apart over time? Or does it come from an infalling cluster slash satellite galaxy? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't think I directly addressed this, but um, if it was an infalling satellite galaxy, uh, we wouldn't expect it to have the orbit that it does around the Milky Way. It's so, it's, it's a very circular orbit uh, very confined to the galactic plane. So it almost certainly formed within the, the Milky Way disk and has just been torn apart in the process. Thank you. Uh, currently, the last question we have right now is for Borja and Zindlin from Rick Lovett. Oh, never mind. We've got another question. So, but anyway, Rick's question is a question about the wave. What processes perpetuate it? Do the stars rise above the pl plane, pull up? The ones behind them by their gravity. I think ripples in Saturn's rings work that way, right? Uh, I will take that question. Actually, yes. It's very similar to the ripples in the uh, ring of Saturn. Basically, after the initial gravitational perturbation from the satellite galaxy, um, the wave propagates around the entire Milky Way. Uh, the outer part of the Milky Way by just one star pulling the other, pulling the one that next to it. Thank you. Uh, this question's for Jeff. It comes from Leslie Sage of Nature. How long will it take for the structure to turn into field stars? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> So this, this is exactly the kind of thing that, that uh, I have planned to do you know, next week. <laughs> um, I haven't yet rolled the clock forward and figured out how the stars are going to evolve in the future. One of the problems is that the radio velocity measurements are not precise enough to be able to go too far in the future. So um, we're, we're working on getting better data with it's more precise to be able to have a, a really better picture of, of how this thing looks. But I do wanna say it's, it's very possible and even likely that many of the stars from this structure have already stripped off and are already in the field. And so we think it doesn't happen at one time. It's sort of a process that it gets disrupted and the stars dissipate in the disk. Thank you. Uh, this next question is for Siley from Martin Ratcliffe, freelance. Do you have any information regarding a type of the no previously unknown objects found in the Sirius field of view? Are they all background stellar objects? Can I see the question again? Um, okay. I'm, I'm muted, oh, my bad. Uh, yeah. It's an um, answer at the bottom. So, uh, so the previously unknown objects, the ones which I'm using the detection, um, the, uh, the source detection on, the ones which were uh, highlighted and um, marked on the image, were the ones for which uh, the Gaussian XY profile was fitted correctly. So the ones which are um, illustrated on that image were the stellar objects, but we wouldn't be surprised if there are non-circular, um, non non-stellar objects present over there because the, the whole field of view is um, 10 by 10 arc, uh, arc minutes. So yes, there will be other types of objects out there, but not just uh, you know, stellar objects. So that's the next step 
for me is to apply not only circular aperture photometry, but um, the uh, elliptical aperture um, photometry and see what type of sources uh, there are along with um, uh, signal to noise ratio measurements and um, actually have a different optimize my uh, detection algorithm, not just to extract stellar sources, but uh, the possibility uh, given to the fact that there might be, um, there will be other um, non-stellar objects too. Thank you. And that is all the questions we have. Well, you haven't asked, called on me yet. <laughs> right, fire away. All right. Just so the audience knows, that those of us who are, who are uh, on the panel here, we're, we're not able to type our questions into the Q&A box. So um, I've got one for Kat first and then one for uh, Siley. So for Kat, um, I'm, I can't help but ask if uh, Canon is, uh, if he majored in astronomy or physics, if he's planning to go to graduate school and if we can look forward to um, having him part of our community going forward. Yeah, for a while he was double majored and I think he might still be double majored. He's really interested in becoming an astronaut. And so um, after he saw that the Martian movie, he realized that engineering skills were extraordinarily important. So he's majoring in electrical engineering and we're hoping that he's still going to pick up his you know, physics and astronomy degree, but I don't know. Um, I think he probably will be going to graduate school too. I think he kind of wants to get as much as he can to be the best astronaut possible. Not surprising. Uh, a question for Siley. Um, before the, uh, while we were organizing the briefing, I, I commented uh, by an email to her that, uh, that I had actually used a CID, a charge injection device when I was doing my PhD thesis. Um, and so th this was an infrared camera, mid-infrared. Uh, we were working on prototyping uh, cameras for the, what ultimately became the Spitzer Space Telescope. And as you know, the Spitzer Space Telescope ended up not using CIDs, but using CCDs. Um, and I had pretty much thought that the CID was a technology that had died. So, so what's it been doing the last 30 years and, and how recently is it that it sort of came back and, and is suddenly becoming uh, viable for, uh, for space astronomy and even some ground-based astronomy? Yes, um, so let me check if my Mac, okay, it's unmuted. Uh, so uh, first, um, one of the reasons why CCDs were preferred before than CIDs because of their read noise, uh, uh, because of the amount of what the read noise was. Uh, CIDs had, uh, the previous generations of CIDs had more read noise compared to uh, CCDs. Therefore, CCDs were always been preferred to CIDs. But since then, um, they have been uh, working on these uh, different generations of uh, CIDs uh, detectors where the readout architectures have evolved, say from um, they had these uh, pre-amplifier column uh, readout structures, uh, pre-amplifier uh, row architectures. And then now um, the latest generation the one which uh, the once was used for this research, the SpectraCam XTR, um, had a pre-amplifier uh, per pixel. So that was PP uh, P architecture that was used. And with the help of these non-destructive readouts, um, the read noise actually decreased um, to the square root of n, where n was the number of reads used for per um, readout architect uh, scheme, readout scheme. So uh, that's why um, CIDs and also CIDs have better spectral response and they are radiation hard. So not just for, so that's why when we tested out, when we tested the data for the, from the uh, International Space Station, uh, we actually looked at where the um, ISS uh, International Space Station was uh, when it orbited around the Earth. And even when it was going through the, what is called as the South um, Atlantic anomaly, it didn't suffer, the data didn't suffer or no um, changes in the, uh, CID of, um, performance was um, seen. And also the fact that um, the temperature variations so because of the day and night circulation um, uh, as um, see, um, ISS orbits around the earth, you see these day and night temperature variations, but there were no um, on orbit changes in the CID performance. So because of these advantages, yes, um, CIDs have been gaining, uh, are getting back into this track where the uh, it is possible to consider them not just for uh, ground-based observations, but for uh, space-based observations too. 
Thank you. So I was even more of a pioneer than I knew at the time. That's great. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think since we're at 1.15 p.m. Eastern, uh, that, we'll, uh, that we'll call it a wrap. Uh, I wanna thank all of our speakers again uh, for very interesting presentations. I'm sure this will lead to lots of good press coverage in the next few days. I uh, wanna thank the audience, those of you who uh, have attended. Um, and I wanna also thank the speakers, uh, public information officers who helped prep you for your briefings and also uh, for those who prepared press releases. Uh, the uh, next br uh, briefing, the final briefing of this meeting will occur at uh, 4.30 p.m. Eastern time today. And it'll be, it'll be the second of our briefings on evolving stars and nebulae. Um, and we'll feature, uh, among other things, some really nice images uh, of planetary nebulae from the Hubble Space Telescope. So please come right. back at uh, 4.30, yes. I just wanted to step in real quick with one more announcement before we okay. sign off, which is that you all might have seen uh, that the AAS is hosting a retirement tribute for Rick tonight at 7.15 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so we hope that you will all join us. I'll drop the details in the Slack. Thanks for that, Susanna. And I do want to make sure everybody understands that while I'm uh, while I am retiring later this year, uh, it's not until after the next meeting. So uh, I have one more of these meetings to put together, and I'm looking forward to the to the June meeting. We don't know yet if it will be virtual or in person in Anchorage, uh, but we hope to have that sorted out within the next month or two. So keep your eye on that uh, on announcements for that. Um, all right, so that's it. So I'm going to uh, shut us down and we'll see everybody again at 4.30 this afternoon. Thanks everybody. Thank you, bye-bye.